gave in March 2014 concerning the ongoing work on the sequel to my best-known book, Fingerprints of the Gods, and the sequel is probably going to be called Magicians of the Gods and probably published in late 2015 or early 2016. I just want to use this opportunity to say a couple of things. First of all, uh, the presentation that I gave in March 2014 that you're going to be watching uh, is very much a presentation of a work in progress. Uh, since I gave that presentation, I've done a further research trip, a very long one, in Indonesia. Uh, I've done a research trip in the Lebanon, uh, looking at the incredible megaliths of Baalbek. I've done another research trip in Turkey, going back to Gobekli Tepe, probably the most important archaeological site in the world, and uh, visiting other as yet unexcavated sites of the same antiquity in that region of Turkey. Uh, I also did a research trip in Armenia. Uh, and all of these uh, trips are, are not mentioned or discussed at all in the presentation that I gave in March 2014. Another research trip that I did just in September and October, which again is not mentioned in that March 2014 presentation, was a huge journey across North America uh, with the catastrophist researcher, brilliant, brilliant man, Randall Carson, who showed me through his eyes the effects of the cataclysmic flooding that hit North America uh, 12,800 or 12,900 years ago after a comet hit the North American ice cap. Uh, and again, I'm not presenting that material in the presentation that you're going to be watching. Uh, but I think the presentation does respond to the request that many have put my way that I share uh, more publicly than simply in lectures some of the information that I've been researching and it will give you at least a glimpse uh, as to the direction in which my new work on Magicians of the Gods is going uh, and it also recapitulates some of the work that I did in Fingerprints of the Gods so I hope you enjoy it sit down relax here we go It's a great pleasure to welcome back to Alternatives, uh, Graham. Um, he's been here many times before, um, and um, he was, his career started, he was originally a journalist, um, he was working in Africa, and uh, a trip to Ethiopia took him into another uh, sphere, and um, his interest in lost civilizations was sparked. So please join me in giving Graham Hancock a very warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a, a warm welcome. I really, really appreciate it. It's, it's, a, it's a great honor and a, a privilege for me to have the opportunity to, to talk to you. And, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, I am going to talk tonight uh, about, I suppose, the subject that has been my main theme for, for more than 20, 25 years, really, which is the possibility of a lost civilization. Um, I am working on a sequel to Fingerprints of the Gods, which will be published in uh, 2015, in October 2015, roughly, if I deliver the manuscript on time. And uh, it's provisionally called Ma Magicians of the Gods. That may change as well. So what I'm going to be doing this evening is talking through a work in progress. Uh, there will be uh, some new material that nobody has ever, uh, that I've never presented before, and there will be some uh, review of, uh, of, of older material as well. Um, some slides may be familiar to you if you've seen me talk before, but I hope you'll accept that in, in context of uh, a work in progress. I think we could start by turning the, 
these lights down of, over here. Um, I've also, uh, be, somewhat contrary to the wishes of my publishers, been developing a parallel career as a novelist. And uh, I have a series of novels about the Spanish conquest of Mexico uh, called uh, War God. Uh, the first volume, uh, War God, Knights of the Witch, is coming out in paperback on the 27th of March. Uh, but we do have some advanced copies of the paperback here. Uh, I'll be very happy after the talk to sign books, uh, sing and dance, pose for photos, whatever, you know. <laughs> I'd be very happy to do that. What I'm showing on the right of the screen is the second volume, War God, Return of the Plumed Serpent, uh, which I've uh, just delivered to my publishers and which is going to be published in uh, October uh, this year, October 2014. So for those who think that I never finish my series, uh, I definitely have the second volume in the bag now. And uh, th there will be a third volume uh, as well. But this is uh, my book, Fingerprints of the Gods, a, a well-thumbed copy, uh, completely distorted by the screen. We could not overcome the technological problems. Uh, and what are, uh, the, the effect is that the screen is making everything long and thin. Um, this book was published in uh, 1995, amazingly, nearly 20 years ago now. Uh, and I had no idea at the time that it was going to strike a nerve with the public or that there was going to be any kind of reaction to it uh, at all. Uh, I, th I thought that it would just disappear without a trace, as most of my books before that had done. Uh, but for some reason, it did, it did strike a nerve, and uh, it, it did so in, in many countries uh, all, all around the world. Uh, and caused a, a huge furore, which I also had not expected. Uh, when you uh, criticize the mainstream archaeological view, the picture of our past that we're given by the education system, by the archaeologists, and by their friends in the, in the media, uh, the unforgivable sin is to do so successfully. Uh, if you criticize in a way that nobody notices, you don't get any reaction, and they just assign you to the lunatic fringe, and you're gone. But if by chance, and it was chance, I, I think it was the, 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 there was just something in the air in the early to mid-90s which, which led to the success of this book. This resulted in a, a, a furious series of attacks upon me and upon my work, which I was not at all uh, prepared for. Um, and and uh, I had to learn how to deal with that, and I also had to learn I had to learn to accept and welcome that, uh, because that is, um, that is the way that ideas move forward. Uh, it's, it, you have to be prepared to have ideas criticized and, and, and criticized violently uh, if you are uh, opposing the mainstream. Now, the, the gist of the book was that, that civilization is older and more mysterious than we thought. And one of the many uh, magazines that attacked me uh, for proposing this hypothesis was a uh, New Scientist magazine. So I have to admit a certain warm glow when this headline appeared in New Scientist in <laughs> October 2013. The true dawn, civilization is older and more mysterious than we thought. This was just October last year. Um, I, I shall preserve that image. Uh, th throughout the rest of my time on this planet, because it just was a very, very nice moment to, to see that. And I'll, we'll be going into, into why there is a gro growing recognition that there's something seriously wrong with the picture of history, uh, as I indeed maintained in, in Fingerprints of the Gods. Um, so this is the, the conventional view uh, of, our, of our past. Again, I'm sorry, it's difficult to see the images clearly, but about two million years ago, you get the lower Paleolithic, the old, the old Stone Age, the first stone tools are, are created. Um, some evidence of religious beliefs actually a bit earlier than 28,000 years ago. I think you could easily push that back to 70 or 80,000 years ago now. Uh, there's the last Ice Age, the coldest period of the last Ice Age, but it's really only well after 12,000 years ago 
that you get into the so-called Neolithic, the stone circles, Stonehenge, Avery, places like that, and the, and the so-called agricultural revolution. And the first civilizations are thought to have emerged in the fourth millennium BC. We're talking 3,600, 3,300 before Christ in, in places like Sumer in Mesopotamia. And ancient Egypt, the first dynasty, the pre-dynastic period is into the third, into the fourth millennium BC, the first dynasty on the cusp of the fourth and third millennia BC. So roughly 5,000 years ago, would be, would be the time when, when civilization is supposed to have begun. Uh, and there is, uh, th th these are images from Sumer uh, in, in Mesopotamia, the area occupied by modern Iraq, and, and what we're looking at here are pictures of the city of Ur, known in the Bible as Ur of the Chaldees, uh, which isn't that old, it's about 2100, 2200 BC, uh, but there are predecessors to Ur, uh, which, which go back further, certainly into the 3,300, 3,400, more than 5,000 years in the past. And you can see that this was a pretty advanced civilization at that time, building gigantic structures, mainly with mud brick uh, at the time. Now, the interesting thing is that there is a flood myth from Sumer. Uh, it's called the Epic of Gilgamesh, and in fact, our story of Noah in the Bible is derived from the Epic of Gilgamesh. There are very clear similarities. Uh, the notion that the gods became angered with mankind at some remote time in the past and sent a gigantic flood which virtually destroyed all of mankind with, with a few survivors who preserved the seeds of, of future civilization. Um, and there is also a figure called Oannes, uh, who oddly enough wears a fish on his head. He's called a fish-garbed figure. Um, and he is a civilizing hero who emerged from the waters of the flood and, and taught civilization again to a devastated mankind. So the myth is saying that before the current epoch of civilization, there was an earlier epoch of civilization which was brought to an end by a cataclysmic flood. If we go to Egypt now, uh, many Egyptologists will tell you that, that there is no story of Atlantis in Egypt. And they say that's a problem because Plato claims through his, his antecedent Solon that he got the story of Atlantis from Egypt. They say there's no story of Atlantis in Egypt, and that's true. There is no single Egyptian text that refers to Atlantis as such. But there are the Edfu building texts. These are very interesting texts. This is a Ptolemaic temple, the Temple of Horus at Edfu. It's not that old by Egyptian standards. It was actually built about 400, 300 before Christ in the Ptolemaic period, 2,300 years ago. But they said that they had inherited a document from ancient times. And that document was in such a fragile state, it was so remotely ancient, that it was falling apart. And they needed to preserve the information in that document in a permanent form. So they decided to copy the document onto the walls of this temple, the Temple of Horus at Edfu. Uh, and these are called the Edfu building texts. And they indeed do speak of a former age a time of the gods, a great flood, an island uh, on, on which an advanced culture thrived, the homeland of the primeval, flood, the primeval ones. Uh, and it tells how it was destroyed in a cataclysmic flood and how the survivors came to Egypt and uh, established the basis of what in due course would become Egyptian civilization. But this isn't set just before the first dynasty. This is set in the time of the gods, Zeptepi, the first time thousands and thousands of years in the past. So Egypt does have uh, a flood myth. Now there's Plato, uh, and he is the, the earliest surviving source of the story of Atlantis. And Plato said that he got the story of Atlantis from his ancestor Solon, the famous lawmaker, who lived around 600 BC, and that Solon in turn had got the story in Egypt. Uh, and that what Solon was told was that Atlantis existed 9,000 years before his time. In other words, 9,600 BC in our calendar. In other words, 11,600 years ago. And a cat catastrophic series of floods and earthquakes caused Atlantis to be submerged in a single 
day and a night. And the effects were global and so devastating that mankind had to begin again like children with no memory of what went before. Academic view is that this story is totally made up by Plato and that there is no factual basis to it whatsoever. But it's very interesting that he pins that date. He says the date that we would call 9,600 BC because that date is actually highly significant. 11,600 years before the present, 9,600 BC is the end of an epoch that the geologists call the Younger Dryas. And the Younger Dryas I'll be going into more detail in that, is a very mysterious period in our history, and it's really not such a remote history. It's 12,000 years ago or so. Uh, The Earth is coming out of the Ice Age. The ice sheets have been melting. Sea levels have been rising. And then suddenly, there's a a radical and dramatic reversal of climate. There's an enormous deep freeze takes place. And uh, the, the world plunges back into the worst extremes of the Ice Age, and we have huge extinctions of animal species. This is when we lose the mammoths and and many of the large uh, mammals from that period. It's during the Younger Dryas. So it's really interesting that Plato ties in the end of Atlantis to a date that makes perfect sense to to geologists today as a cataclysmic epoch. 9,600 BC was the end of the Younger Dryas. It's when that deep freeze stopped, and sea levels rose very, very radically. Uh, following 9,600 BC, 11,600 BP. And the Younger Dryas begins 12,980 years before the present, and it ends 11,600 years before the present. So we're obviously interested in why it begins as well. We'll come to that. Now, the Plato story of Atlantis, this is actually Anastasius Kirch's map, and that's the island, the insula Atlantis, it, in those days, they, they made maps the other way round. Um, n- normally, we would expect to see Spain and, and North Africa on the right of the map and the Americas on the left, but Kirchhoff put it the other way round. But the Atlantis story seems to focus very much on the Atlantic Ocean. But we shouldn't uh, forget that there are similar stories uh, all around the world. And I want to take you to India, Uh, where the earliest known historical civilizations are the civilizations of the Indus Valley, which are roughly uh, dating from the same period as ancient Sumer and ancient Egypt. 5,000 plus years ago is the beginning of those civilizations. And uh, this is uh, Mohenjo-daro in uh, in what is now Pakistan. And uh, that's actually little me there stepping down into the what's called the Great Bath at Mohenjo-daro. I mean, they look like, in a way, they look like sort of housing estates, in 20th century housing estates made of brick. They're not particularly stunning. They're not like, they're not like the wonders of ancient Egypt, but they're, they're incredibly uh, sophisticated uh, and, and, and amazingly well-planned. This bath, for example, was waterproofed with bitumen in the joints between the, the bricks so that it would maintain the water uh, inside it. And Mohenjo-daro is quite a difficult place to get to. We had to have an armed escort to take us to Mohenjo-daro when Santa and I went there a few years back. And here is Harappa, another one of the great Indus Valley cities, also in Pakistan. And another Indus Valley city is Dolavira. All these cities are in the range of 5,000 years old. And you can see that they, they weren't invented overnight. There must be a background to them. They've reached a high level of civilization. They had wonderful sewage systems. They had perfect drainage. They had uh, uh, comfortable toilets. I mean, really, they were, they were living very well back in the Indus Valley civilization. Well, it turns out that India has a flood myth. Uh, and that is the story, the, the universal flood myth of India is the story of Manu. He's the Indian Noah and the seven rishis, the seven wise men, who are rescued from the flood by the god Vishnu in his avatar as a fish. We're told that the Ark of Manu is attached to a horn on the head of this great fish. More dramatic presentation of the same idea uh, over here. And uh, that just goes back to the earliest possible times in the Indian memory of the past, this notion that there was a flood and that civilization began again after a flood. 
Now, it's interesting, when you look at some of the artworks that have come down to us from the Indus Valley civilization, they, they particularly take the form of these seals which were impressed uh, into clay. And what we can see in a couple of these seals, which, by the way, are both in the range of five to five and a half thousand years old, are seated figures in, in known yoga positions. This position is actually this position, where it's an incredibly painful thing to do if you haven't really planned it out. You know, that's the guy's heels there, and the toes are turned back under his bottom. And that's the position we're seeing in this Sindhus Valley seal, Mulubandasana. Slightly easier version of it here with the toes turned forwards we see here, but this is undoubtedly Mulubandasana. Now what that tells us is that yoga, which we're still practicing today, was already ancient 5,000 plus years ago. It was already fully evolved. The most difficult yoga position, Mulubandasana, was already in place 5,000 years ago. How much earlier before that do we have to go to get back to the origins of yoga? Clearly, it was not just 5,000 years ago. It must be much older than that. Well, there are local flood myths in India as well. We can see from this map that huge areas of India were actually flooded at the end of the Ice Age and after the end of the Younger Dryas. Uh, but let's go to Dwarka uh, up, up here uh, on the Gulf of Kutch. And in Dwarka, there is a detailed story of the god Krishna. It was the city of the god Krishna. And uh, a flood came and destroyed the city, and the whole city was flooded and, and submerged under water. Well, Santa and I have been diving at Dwarka. There's Dwarka as you see it today. It's a very beautiful city on the coast. And there are many rituals which involve veneration of the lost city of Dwarka. And there indeed is a lost city of Dwarka. Uh, underwater off the coast, as the myths say. Uh, and if we go to the Gulf of Cambay, up here in northwest India, uh, Sidescran sonar has shown the remains of gigantic structures underwater, 40 meters underwater, more than 120 feet under the sea. Uh, there are what appear to be two enormous cities along the shores of ancient riverbanks, and those rivers are now, of course, submerged under the, under the sea. They've been underwater for the best part of 12,000 years. This is way before the beginning of the Indus Valley Civilization. And uh, the team from the National Institute of Ocean Technography who took these side scan images also did some dredging, and they brought up man-made artifacts from those structures. To this day, and I cannot explain why, there has been no attempt to dive on the site. It does involve technical diving. You would, you would need, really, to use remotely operated vehicles. It's not, 40 meters is at about the limit of normal scuba diving, but there are huge currents in the Gulf of Cambay, and it's also very turbid and, and muddy water. But for one reason or another, the site has never been dived yet. Um, Indian flood myths also go south uh, into the area that we call Tamil Nadu today. And there's a very specific tradition of a land called Kumari Kandam, which existed to the south of the existing southern tip of India. The existing southern tip of India is a place called Kanya Kumari, and there's a great statue in the sea there to a, to a Tamil poet and uh, philosopher called Thiruvallavar. And uh, he cast our minds back to the myth of the lost land of Kumari Kandam, because they said that there were universities there, and, and advanced scholarship, and, and um, a, a, an academic tradition that they called the Sangam tradition, and that all of this was flooded, guess when? 11,600 years ago, exactly the period that Plato gives us for Atlantis. And uh, studies of the Ice Age sea levels show us that large areas of India were above water until about 11,600 years ago. Down here, again, I apologize for the reproduction of the, of the image, but this is actually a pyramid in the island of the Maldives. Most people think of the Maldives as places to go sunbathe, and they're great for that. But they also have large numbers of small pyramids, uh, very ancient, all over the Maldives. Thor Heyerdahl did some of the excavation. And this is a pyramidal structure. That's the rock the stone uh, blocks that were used to build one of those 
Maldives pyramids. And uh, again, in South India, there's recently been quite a bit of press about the so-called Bridge of Rama, which, uh, which shows up on satellite photographs uh, between Rameswaran and uh, the island of Sri Lanka. Uh, here you can see uh, a, a causeway that goes from Rameswaran uh, out to Darishkodi. And there are ancient blocks of stone in the water there along the side of that causeway. But I'm interested in this area here, uh, which was submerged somewhat after 12,000 years ago, Pumpahar and Mahabalipuram. And there I have been diving and uh, done quite extensive diving. And there's, there's a, a gigantic man-made U-shaped structure more than 100 feet underwater uh, off Pumpahar, uh, which has been submerged for more than 12,000 years with very large, regular blocks of stone. And off Mahabalipuram, oddly enough, I spent my childhood here. I grew up in South India. Uh, and my first swimming lessons were off this beach. Um, it turns out that the local fishermen, uh, there, there are amazing rock-hewn temples along the shore there. The local fishermen told us about underwater ruins uh, off the coast uh, where they would frequently catch their nets and have to send down free divers to, to release the nets. And when we asked them if they'd reported this to anybody, they said that they told everybody about it, but that nobody believed them. So we organized an expedition with the Scientific Exploration Society, and we went diving off Mahabalipuram. And lo and behold, the fishermen's stories are true. Uh, and these underwater ruins uh, actually continue as much as five kilometers off the coast. And they go down to depths uh, in excess of 100 feet underwater, which the geology tells us means they've been there uh, for more than 12,000 years. That's the top of a wall sticking up above the sand, another wall there. I'm putting my diving knife into the gap between two blocks there. Uh, very uh, un unmistakably and, and definitely uh, submerged ruins. And nearby, uh, inland, is a place called Tiruvannamalai, where there's this hill, the red hill, called Arunachala. Uh, and there's an ancient tradition of the flood there. It says that this is the place where the rishis go to when the great flood comes to end the yuga, the world age. Uh, and the ground near it is not at all touched by the four oceans that become agitated at the close of the yuga. When the annihilation of all living beings takes place, all the future seeds are certainly deposited there. Brahmins who resort to the foot of that mountain are called by me after the deluge, and I shall make them study the Vedas, as though the Vedas are an antediluvian text, which is re-studied, re-promulgated, after the flood and brought again into the realm of human culture. And there's an amazing temple at Tiruvannamalai. Uh, one of the great things about India is you're, you're not going to find anything much in India apart from the Indus Valley Civilization, which is five or 6,000 years old as such, because the culture is still alive. It's as though ancient Egypt had continued to live. Yes, they would have continued to build their temples and rebuild them and renovate them and modify them. But that didn't happen in Egypt because Egyptian culture came to an end and everything was frozen at the end of Egyptian civilization. In India, the ancient culture has lived on. And that's why we don't find remotely ancient ruins apart from the Indus Valley civilization in India. Uh, because these sites of temples have been temples since time immemorial, but we're seeing the latest incarnation of the temples on those sites. Let's jump over to Indonesia now which again, as you can see from this image, was a very different looking place during the Ice Age. Here are the Indonesian islands today, but during the Ice Age there was a huge continent, continent-sized landmass above water there. And uh, there's some interesting anomalies in Indonesia. I think anybody who's familiar with Latin America would, taking a look at this temple, which is actually in central Java, called Suku, would, would say that it's a, it's a Mexican step pyramid. It looks incredibly like the pyramid of Kukulkan at Chichen Itza, uh, but in fact it's, uh, it's Javanese, it's in, it's in Indonesia. And um, either it's a total coincidence or more I would suggest that there is a remote common ancestor which is affecting both of these widely separated cultures. 
So let's go to the city of Bandung. And about three hours' drive from the city of Bandung is what I regard presently right now as the most exciting archaeological site in the world. And that is the site called Gunung Padang in West Java, uh, Indonesia, where a very gutsy geologist called Danny Hillman Natawijaja, a PhD from Cornell University, is the senior geologist at Indonesia's Geotechnology Center. And he has done a massive survey of Gunung Padang, and I'm going to go into some of the details of that. And his conclusion is it's older than 9,000 years, and it could be up to 20,000 years. It's a strong case, but not an easy one. We're up against the world's belief. Not only that, but up against vested interests in mainstream archaeology, who, when Danny came out with his results, which are based on, on carbon dating and very extensive remote sensing surveys, when he came out with his results, they petitioned the government of Indonesia to stop all work on Gunung Padang. No further work should be allowed on Gunung Padang because it cannot possibly be true that it is more than 9,000 years old and perhaps as much as 20,000 years old. This is a distant view of Gunung Padang. And what you're looking at is a man-made pyramid about 100 meters high, 300 plus feet high. And the site that is known to archaeology and has been known to archaeology is up at the top there. And there I am in December uh, with Danny Hillman, that geologist, and with my friend Robert Schock. Robert Schock is the professor of geology at Boston University. I find geologists much more open-minded on the issue of the antiquity of civilization. He's the man who did the work on the redating of the Sphinx back in the 90s based on the erosion patterns in the body of the Sphinx. And he and I went together to uh, Gunung Padang uh, in December last year. And uh, here Danny is showing us various results of their remote sensing work. And this is what Gunung Padang looks like. This is the bit known to archaeology. Unbelievably, although they tell us that it is about 2,500 years old, the mainstream archaeologists, there's never been any detailed carbon dating there. Just a tiny little bit of carbon dating has been done at a very shallow level. And on the basis of that, they attribute the whole site to 2,500 years ago. But the site is, we now know, much more complicated than that. Now, it's made of these, of, this is called columnar basalt. It's a kind of basalt that forms naturally, but it's obviously being used here as a building block on a very large scale with pyramidal mounds. Remember, all of this is at the top of a site that's actually 300 feet deep. And the new findings relate to that deeper site. The previous research has only been done on the top. And this is where mainstream archaeology, I, I believe, has made a huge mistake with regard to Gunung Padang. And that's the, the little bit of carbon dating that the mainstream archaeologists have done that make them attribute the site to 2,500 years before the present. But even with the naked eye, you can see that there's much more to the site than what we find just on the top of it. Those, three, those, those five terraces sit on top of a pyramid, really. And so Danny and his team, who call themselves the Independent Integrated Multidisciplinary Team, have done a lot of remote sensing, surface geology. They've done archaeology. They've done geomagnetic survey, ground-penetrating radar, electrical resistivity, seismic tomography, drill core sampling. They've done lab, lab work, and they've done architectural analysis. And this is some of the, 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 the photography of their work uh, in situ uh, at the site before they were stopped in 2013 by a cabal of mainstream archaeologists who said, you have no right to work on this site. We've already established that this site is just 2,500 years old, and please don't damage it. They were very careful not to damage it, but they were stopped working on it. Uh, nevertheless, their results uh, are very extensive and are, are produced using the latest uh, technology. And I just want to show some of the images to, to make you understand that Danny and his team have done very extensive work on Gunung Padang. Uh, and a lot of it has been about imaging what's inside that pyramid. 
using remote sensing uh, equipment. And here's the carbon dating from their deep drill cores. And what happens is that we get dates that don't fit at all with the mainstream picture. And that's particularly so in drill core two. There's that little bit of mainstream archaeology up at the top. But then as we go deeper, we're getting back to 7,880 BC. We're getting dates from 28,000 years ago uh, down in the heart of that, of that pyramid. Uh, dates from 21,000 years ago. That's at the last glacial maximum. Uh, and interestingly, a date from 11,600 years ago, the, the end of the Younger Dryas. So this looks like a site that has been constantly worked on and built up over thousands and thousands of years. And what we are seeing at the top is just the latest layer of it. What all the remote sensing agrees on is that there is a chamber in the heart of this pyramid, a very high resistivity body. And it is extremely regular in form. And uh, they're certain that it is a man-made chamber. Just there. And again here. It's a possibility that it's what's, a, what's called a lava tunnel, which has been modified. Lava tunnels don't have the regularity that show up on the remote sensing of this, uh, of this place. Uh, but it could be a modified lava tunnel. And interestingly, over in Teotihuacan in Mexico, underneath the Pyramid of the Sun, there's exactly the same thing. There's a modified lava tunnel leading to a large chamber which has been cut out of the solid lava. And it appears to be the reason why the Pyramid of the Sun was first built. So it looks like we've got something very similar to that in Gunung Padang. And here you can see how you get into it. The entrance would be through there, and there's that chamber in the heart of the monument. So every single remote sensing scan that they've done shows up this large chamber in the heart of Gunung Padang. And uh, it's not the only one. That's the large chamber, but there's two other chambers also show up in the remote sensing. So it would be a very exciting place to do further work on, to take the work that Danny and his team have done and develop it further. Um, particularly when we consider the Ice Age history of the region. Because these Indonesian islands as we know them today were the highlands of what was a gigantic Ice Age continent, very well watered, fertile continent with huge river systems that geology has, uh, has established. Uh, and, and which uh, would have been an ideal home for a great civilization. And why wouldn't we find evidence of that civilization today? Why? Because the whole area was submerged at the end of the last ice age, leaving only the higher areas above water. And lo and behold, on one of those high areas, we find Gunung Padang. And it's not alone. There are many other megalithic sites around Gunung Padang, which I believe are going to have to be reconsidered. It's a very tempting area for anybody with the slightest, remotest curiosity about our past. And it's absurd that for a year and a half, work should have been stopped on that site. But Danny is not a man who gives up. And he has taken this to the highest possible level uh, and just uh, a week ago, he had the president of Indonesia visit the site. That's Danny showing the president of Indonesia some of the remote scans. That's the president there. And the president has agreed that research will resume on the site. So they're now back in action. And that site is going to be the result of a very extensive investigation uh, over the coming 18 months or so. I think it's going to completely rewrite history. Let's look more broadly at this region. Here's Australia, Indonesia, Th uh, Malaysian Peninsula, Southeast Asia as it is today. And, and here's how it was 
during the Ice Age, Australia was much bigger. And, and let's look at Micronesia. I don't particularly want to draw attention to Yap Island. It was just the map I was able to get on the Google Images. What I want to draw attention to is Ponape, the island of Ponape, because I've been diving there. And weirdly, there's a site made in exactly the same way as Gunung Padang at Ponape, and it's called Nan Madol. And it's made of columnar basalt blocks. And here are some comparisons between Nan Madol and Gunung Padang. Now, Namadol is only supposed to be about a thousand years old, uh, but I think the work at Gunung Padang raises huge question marks over that. And not only the work at Gunung Padang, but also the fact that there's Namadol on the left, there's Gunung Padang on the right, but also the fact that the ruins at Namadol do continue underwater. Now, Madol is on the edge of the sea, and off in this bay, we find that the ruins continue underwater, and they just keep going down, and they change in character, and you get these huge columns standing up from the seabed. And you get fallen columns, like this one, at about 120 feet under the sea. Uh, and it's just incredibly similar to this huge megalithic column from the island of Tinian, again in that same general area of the Pacific. Uh, Tinian is just up there, near Saipan. And I think it raises, again, huge questions over the antiquity of, these, uh, of all of these monuments. Let's go back to Indonesia. Uh, there is Gunung Padang, 110 meters high, and there's undoubtedly the most famous monument of Indonesia, uh, which is Borobudur. And Borobudur is an amazing uh, Buddhist temple da dating from about 800 AD. It's just the most incredible place. And Santa and I uh, spent a week there uh, in December. Uh, and in this amazing volcanic landscape, there's Gunung Merapi, the volcano. That's Borobudur. That's the temple of Borobudur, just sticking up out of the dawn mist. There's Borobudur again. Let's go closer. It's a kind of, it's not stretching things to say that it is a pyramidal monument built in a series of levels. Um, and just an interesting side point, we do know from historical records that Borobudur took about 90 years to build. It is a tiny fraction of the size of the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is supposed to have been built in just 20 years. Uh, I think that raises questions over the whole argument about the Great Pyramid. But what I want to focus on in, in um, Borobudur uh, is the possibility that although it was built in a known period of history, 800 AD or so, uh, that it incorporates a much more ancient system of ideas. And it does so in particular in terms of a series of numbers that are expressed in Borobudur. There are 72 stupas around the central dome uh, of Borobudur. These are a few of those stupas. And each one of them contains a Buddha statue. In some cases, those Buddha statues have been exposed by vandalism uh, during the, the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, and in some cases, you can, you can see the Buddha statue still, in, still inside the dome. Altogether, there's 504 Buddha statues at Borobudur. 432 are on the square terraces that make up the pyramidal form, and the other 72 are on the circular terraces uh, at the top. 432 plus 72 gives you 504. Please keep those numbers in mind, uh, because I've been banging on about this for a very long time. And uh, I want to make this point again here that there appears to be a relationship in terms of degrees of longitude between a number of sacred sites around the world. And those sites include Tiruvannamalai in South India, where we were earlier in the talk. They include Ponape in Micronesia. And they also include Angkor in Cambodia. Uh, and if we go to Angkor, we find that there are 72 major temples at Angkor. Uh, as I often point out, 
Angkor actually means life to the Horus in the ancient Egyptian language. Again, I'm not disputing that the Angkor temples are built when archaeologists say they were built, in other words, about 1100 AD. Uh, but I'm suggesting that they are the latest incarnation of much earlier temples and that they incorporate very ancient ideas. Uh, Angkor is aligned to the rising sun at the spring equinox, and uh, you get this beautiful effect at dawn on the spring equinox where the sun sits exactly over the central tower. Uh, and as I've been pointing out for years, the temples of Angkor are laid out on the ground in the pattern of a constellation, and that is the constellation of Draco in the northern heavens. And we can use modern astronomical software to establish quite easily that the exact correlation between sky and ground takes place in 10,500 BC, 12 and a half thousand years ago. So it's as though the temples of Angkor are commemorating at least a very ancient date. I'm not saying they were built at that time, but I'm saying that they speak of that time, rather in the way that a Christian cathedral built in the 1200s speaks of the time of Christ or even of the time of the patriarchs. Uh, the symbolism is harking back to a much earlier time. And if we jump over to Giza, we find that it's 72 degrees of longitude west of Angkor. Uh, and again, these numbers occur. There's the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid, very spiritual place associated with spiritual rituals, but it's also very mathematical. And the number 216, if you put a zero on the end of that, you get 2160, that's 30 times 72, uh, is derived from the, th the 345 triangle uh, inside the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid stands on latitude 30 degrees north, one third of the way between the equator and the North Pole, a significant latitude. Uh, and the Great Pyramid is aligned to within three sixtieths of a single degree of true north. This is one of the reasons, by the way, why I'm not an enormous fan of the ancient alien hypothesis. I'm sure the universe is full of life. I have no doubt whatsoever that there are inhabited planets elsewhere in the universe, but I don't see a single ancient monument that requires technology at the level that could cross interstellar space to explain it. And there's no doubt that the Great Pyramid of Giza is the single most mysterious ancient monument in the world. But it has inaccuracies. Its side lengths vary by as much as seven inches. It is three sixtieths of a single degree off true north. That's incredibly accurate work. But I don't think it's work that requires the level of technology that you would need to cross interstellar space. I think it's human work. What I think it speaks of is a lost civilization. Uh, rather than uh, of an alien visitation. That's just my personal point of view. I, I'm, I'm not putting the alien hypothesis down. I, I just, it doesn't do the work for me. It doesn't explain what I see on the ground. And again, those numbers, that the Great Pyramid turns out to be a scale model of the northern hemisphere of the Earth on a scale of 1 to 43,200. Take the height, multiply by 43,200, you get the polar radius of the Earth. Take the equatorial circumference, uh, sorry, take the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid, multiply by the same number, 43,200, and you get the uh, equatorial circumference of the Earth. And these are all numbers based on 72, which we find turning up so frequently at uh, Borobudur. Uh, and what they speak of is the precession of the Earth's axis, which unfolds at the rate of one degree every 72 years and changes the pole star and changes the stars that rise on the horizon at the equinox. Uh, and uh, 72 is the heartbeat of that cycle. Half of 72 is 36. 72 plus 36 is 108. 108 divided by 2 is 54. That's why there's 504 Buddhas on the Temple of Borobudur. We find those numbers in the Mayan calendar. We find them in myths and traditions all around the world, going back to the remotest antiquity. And what I'm suggesting is that the knowledge of a lost civilization uh, is being passed down in these myths and traditions. The Great Sphinx, also an equinoctial marker, like the Temple of Angkor in Cambodia, gazing at the rising sun at dawn on the spring equinox. And that's where this mysterious 
diagram that we have at Giza, where if you take the sky on the spring equinox around 12 and a half thousand years ago, you get the constellation exactly at the moment of dawn, you get the, of, when the, the sun breaks the horizon, you get the constellation of Orion lying due south with the three belt stars in the pattern of the three great pyramids, as my friend Robert Vaval long ago pointed out in his book, The Orion Mystery. Uh, and you get the constellation of Leo rising in the east, housing the sun and mirrored on the ground by the great sphinx. It seems to me that a knowledge of the heavens is being used to speak to a remotely ancient date at Giza, and that's the date that we call between 10,000 and 11,000 BC in our calendar. Same thing is done at the Hoover Dam, just to say that this is not a completely crazy idea. Uh, it's done in modern times. There's a huge piece of sculpture at the Hoover Dam which freezes the skies over the Hoover Dam at the moment the dam was completed. And um, Oscar Hansen, who put that there, said that he believed that in remote ages to come, intelligent people with knowledge of precession would be able to discern the astronomical time of the dam's dedication. In other words, you don't want, if you want to send a message to the future, you don't want to use a time-limited language which nobody may be able to speak in 10,000 years. You want to use a language which is expressed in universals like mathematics and astronomy that any intelligent culture will be able to decode. And that is the suggestion of what is happening at Giza. Now, the astronomy only says that Giza speaks of the early date, but the geology and Robert Schock's work on the Sphinx uh, says that uh, Giza, at least some aspects of the site, are actually 12,000 plus years old. Uh, and I've, I've gone into this many times before, but it's these deep erosion channels uh, in the trench around the Sphinx and on the body of the Sphinx itself that speak of exposure to thousands of years of heavy rainfall. And you have to go back to the end of the Younger Dryas to find that, uh, that kind of rain, the Neolithic subpluvial that could have weathered the Sphinx in the way that, it is sphinx, uh, that, that, that we see it. So there's a suggestion from geology that the Sphinx might be more than 12,000 years old, a suggestion that has been absolutely rejected by mainstream archaeology. There's something else in Egypt, which I, which I haven't shown before, but this is uh, off Alexandria. Now, it's well known that there are submerged ruins off Alexandria, uh, and those submerged ruins are of a recent historical period. They were caused by landslip, and they're Ptolemaic temples, and they date from the time of Cleopatra. And that's what we're looking at on the left here. But on the right, what we're looking at is a site that we were taken to uh, by Ashraf Bishai, this gentleman here who used to be a technical diver with the Egyptian Navy. Uh, and he discovered this site, and after more than a week of searching, we rediscovered it. And it's a huge megalithic site, uh, about 110 feet underwater, in deep water off the coast of Alexandria. That means it's more than 12,000 years old as well. But the argument was, how could the Sphinx possibly be 12,000 years old because there is no other site in the world that is known to be 12,000 years old. Certainly no other megalithic site. Our ancestors 12,000 years ago were just supposed to be hunter-gatherers. And that's why Gobekli Tepe in Turkey uh, is another one of those sites that is rewriting history. By the way, it is 7.2 degrees of latitude north of Giza. Uh, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey uh, is like Gunung Padang, uh, a site that is causing even the most stuck-in-the-mud mainstream archaeologists to rethink their view of the past. Uh, because this site is more than 12,000 years old. Uh, and Gobekli Tepe was built more than 12,000 years ago. It was deliberately buried 10,000 years ago, and it stayed buried for the next 10,000 years until this gentleman I'm talking to here, Klaus Schmidt from the German Archaeological Institute, stumbled across the site, excavated it, and found a series of enormous stone circles on the scale of Stonehenge, deliberately buried by whoever created this site. And because it's been deliberately buried, we have some, some of the megaliths. This one was left in situ in the quarry uh, because a natural fracture was found in that T-shaped megalith. Uh, some of them weigh up to 50 tons. And this work is being done undoubtedly 12,000 years ago. Uh, and it cannot be explained by the mainstream model of history that has our ancestors as simple, disorganized hunter-gatherers at that period. This requires an organized 
effort to, to do a site like this, particularly since ground-penetrating radar, as Klaus Schmidt is telling me here, uh, reveals that the stone circles they've so far excavated are just a tiny part of the story, and that there's perhaps 50 times as much remaining to be excavated under the ground. So the, the work on Gobekli Tepe, in a way, is only just beginning. And none of that work was known when Robert Schock was arguing that the Sphinx was 12,000 plus years old back in the early 1990s. Uh, so it, it, it obliges us to take seriously the possibility that the Sphinx is indeed 12,000 plus years old. It's going to require us, I think, to look again at many megalithic sites, such as the Temple of Menaidra in uh, Malta, uh, and such as the T-shaped uh, megaliths of Menorca in the Balearic Islands, which are virtually identical in form to the megaliths of Gobekli Tepe. Continuing west, the Piri Reis map has been the subject of so much controversy over the years because of, it supposedly shows Antarctica, but I'm really interested in this island off the coast of Florida, which doesn't exist today, but did exist 12,000 years ago when the Grand Bahama banks were exposed. And the fact is that this ancient map, which the mapmaker himself tells us in his own handwriting, is based on more than 100 older source maps that have not come down to us, preserves a memory of a series of a row of megaliths running down the middle of that island. Uh, so this puts a whole new light on the so-called Bimini Road, which looks exactly like that megalithic structure on that island now submerged underwater. Let's go west again to Paracas in Peru, which is also on that longitudinal grid. And uh, there we find the amazing candelabra of the Andes. It's a kind of extension of the Nazca lines. Again, I'm sorry that it's not reproducing very well in this light, but there's a huge structure carved out of the desert uh, at Paracas, exactly on that grid. And uh, just inland from there, the Nazca lines. Again, I'm sorry, we're not getting very good reproduction of the images. There's the Nazca spider. And uh, there are also pyramids at Nazca, the pyramids of Kahuachi. If we jump north from Nazca, uh, we come into the area of so-called Inca civilization. This was a very important Inca site on the island of the moon. It was where the future brides of the Inca, the, the, the Inca king. Incas is not, Inca is actually not the name of a people, it's the name of the, the ruler was called the Inca. Uh, and his future brides were kept in this place. It was a very important site to them, and this is what Inca stonework looks like. Uh, so it's puzzling that incredible megalithic architecture in the same area is also attributed to the Incas. Uh, by mainstream archaeology, such as the walls of Sacsayhuaman near Cusco, where you get this incredible jigsaw puzzle effect with megaliths weighing in the range of 100 to 150 tons. Um, there is no evidence at all that the Inca made these walls, but mainstream archaeology has handed them over to the Incas without question. In fact, there are many different types of architecture up there. If you look at these rock-hewn structures at Sacsayhuaman, they're different again. Uh, and here, in this, uh, in this cave, we find this beautifully cut andesite block. And then over here, this rather inferior architecture. Why should we conclude that both are built by the same culture? Uh, isn't it likely that, that two different cultures were involved? Again, a, a, a larger view of that same area here. This work is not the same as this work. You can see it on the streets in Cusco. Uh, clearly, whoever made this is not the same as who made this. Yet archaeologists say they were all made by the Incas in a period of just 200 years before the Spanish conquest in the 16th century. And I spent a lot of time with Jesus Gamara up in Peru uh, looking at these ancient sites. And he has, and his father before him, going back 100 years, have just done incredibly detailed work. And they're, although they're descendants of the Incas themselves, they're absolutely adamant that these structures were not the work of the Incas, and that we're looking at the remnants of a lost civilization 
up in the Andes, which has been mistakenly attributed to the Incas. Go over to Tiwanaku in Bolivia, and just look at the amazing scale of these just vast blocks of stone, the size of diesel engines, that are uh, of train engines, you know, that are, that are there on the Altiplano, 14,000 feet above sea level. Uh, interestingly enough, there is an H-shaped motif that recurs at Tiwanaku. We, we recognize it as a letter H in our alphabet. I'm not suggesting that that's what it was. But the same motif, that H shape, also occurs at Gobekli Tepe uh, in uh, Turkey. And uh, these hands crossed in front of the belly, because those Gobekli Tepe pillars are actually humanoid, and they have elbows and hands with fingers that cross in front of the belly. You find that at Tiwanaku as well. And you find it in this piece of statuary more than 11,000 years old from very nearby Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Uh, these towers are at a place called Kutimbo. Again, they're attributed to the Inca on no very good evidence. And I'm interested in the iconography on these towers. This, uh, this is Gobekli Tepe. This is Kutimbo. Uh, and here is Nazca. Again, I'm sorry, you can't see, but that's a dog figure exactly like this one. Um, Gobekli Tepe, Leonine figure, a Leonine figure, and here this figure with the tail curving forward from Kutimbo. This is Kutimbo in the Andes. This is Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. In Kutimbo, we have this salamander. We have the same salamander at Gobekli Tepe. We have serpents in both places laid out in the same kind of way. Very interesting here in the um, Temple of the Moon near Cusco, uh, a serpent with a large head. It looks almost more like a, a kind of newt than a serpent, or even, dare I say, a sperm, very large-headed serpent with a long tail. That's Peru. But here in Gobekli Tepe, you find exactly the same iconography, this large-headed serpent with the long tail on a pillar from Gobekli Tepe. This is from Peru. This is from Turkey. I'm suggesting that there's a connection between these sites. There's that, that pillar, and again, the crossed hands, and the serpent on the side of a pillar from Tiwanaku in Bolivia. This is Tiwanaku, the two figures on the right. This is Gobekli Tepe on the left. Let's jump over to Easter Island now. And let's reconsider those Easter Island statues. The suggestion is that all the statues date from the period roughly 800 AD to 1400 AD. Uh, but if you look at the architecture of the site, you can see that, uh, for example, this wall on which this, this platform, this ahu, on which these statues stand, actually has an ancient Easter Island head built into its architecture. Um, the suggestion that I would like to make, and that Professor Robert Schock at Boston University is making, is that Easter Island has been misunderstood, that the statues, the so-called Moai, are from a much earlier period, and that they were re-erected by a later culture. This is particularly evident at the Rana Raraku Quarry, where there are statues still in situ that were never re-erected. And if we excavate them as Tor Heyerdahl did in the 1950s, we find that those statues don't just stick a few feet above the ground, but actually go down 30 feet beneath the ground. And what Robert Schock's recent study at Easter Island has shown is that that is sedimentation. And there's just no way that you get that 30 feet of sedimentation in 700 years. It's thousands and thousands of years of sedimentation. And again, the iconography. Those fingers crossed in front of the belly, uh, you find that at Gobekli Tepe, and you find that at Easter Island as well. And of course, the Easter Island figures are bearded. These are bearded men. You can see it quite clearly on some of the statues. Uh, and we have bearded men in Tiwanaku associated with the civilizing deity Viracocha, who came in a time of darkness 
to reestablish civilization after a global cataclysm. Uh, up here on the top of this pillar, I've turned it on its side here, uh, is an image of a, a species of animal that we can't find in the Andes today. Uh, but what it looks very much like is Toxodon. And Toxodon became extinct during the Younger Dryas between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. Bearded men also in Mexico were said to have been bringers of civilization, and we find them in the oldest archaeological lairs of Mexico. And they don't look like Native American Indians at all. Uh, they do look like uh, mysterious strangers in the Americas. And we really don't know. We, we can say that this is at least 3,500 years old, but it may be much, much older than that. And that brings us back to the bearded man of Sumer, the Oannes figure, the, the civilizing hero who emerged after the flood uh, and who is associated with this fish iconography and, uh, and who carries a man bag. Um, see these little man bags here? They're all carrying man bags. There's some sort of symbolism going on here. Fish on head carrying a man bag. Where else do we find the man bag? Oddly enough, we find the man bag in Central America. Exactly the same way. It's actually being held in exactly the same way, too. The way the fingers are turned here. And here is the same, but there's supposed to be no relationship between these cultures at all. They're from they're different periods, thousands of miles apart, and yet the same symbolism is appearing in both places. And it appears in Gobekli Tepe, where we know it's more than 12,000 years old. Those same bag-like figures, bag-like uh, symbols. So. This is where I need to talk, uh, just for the last few moments, uh, about cataclysmic events. Uh, it seems that an effort is being made to draw our attention to the period between 12,000 and uh, 11,000 uh, BC. Uh, be, be, sorry, between 10,000 and 11,000 BC, between 12,000 and 13,000 years ago. That's what the astronomical architecture of Giza speaks to of Angkor Wat speaks to, is that, is that period. Why, are, why is our attention being focused on that period? Are we being told that something very important happened in the world then? And it turns out that something did. And it's the something that caused the Younger Dryas. And it's very recent research, just going back to 2007, that has given us the answers on this, which is that the Earth was hit by the fragments of a giant comet. Maybe not all of it hit the Earth, but large parts of it did. And the dating is now very secure. It's 12,980 years ago, give or take five years. Uh, it was a comet that uh, broke apart, rather like Shoemaker-Levy 9 in 1994. Shoemaker-Levy 9, of course, uh, ended up in Jupiter, which is very fortunate for us. Uh, in fact, generally speaking, it's very fortunate for us that we have Jupiter out there in the outer solar system gathering in comets, because if we didn't, there would be no life on Earth at all. Jupiter's huge get gravity is responsible for sweeping up most of the comets that would hit the Earth. But 12,980 years ago, uh, a comet did hit the Earth, and it hit North America, and it hit predominantly the North American ice cap which at that time was two miles deep, causing initially gigantic flooding. There's been a kind of scientific controversy about this. I just passed through some of the, the scientific articles about it. It was a question originally, but uh, it's now becoming absolutely established that this happened on the Greenland ice cores. Um, this is data from 2000 and, August 2013. The Greenland ice cores settle it. 12,980 years ago, a comet hit the North American ice cap and 
fragments of it hit other parts of the earth as well. The first effect was to liquefy huge amounts of the North American ice cap and, and cause gigantic flooding that went into the oceans and very rapidly raised sea levels. Then the next thing that happened was the deep freeze that's called the Younger Dryas. And that happened because an enormous dust cloud is thrown into the upper atmosphere. And that dust cloud reflects back the sun's rays and stops the sunlight hitting the Earth. That's why we have the Younger Dryas from 12,980 years ago to 11,600 years ago until that dust cloud dissipates. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is that that comet impact did not just kill off the Clovis people, did not just kill off hunter-gatherer societies, but was responsible for the obliteration of a high civilization that is remembered in myths and traditions all around the world, remembered in documents like the Dresden Codex, which uh, speaks of its language so easily could be about a comet impact, and it speaks of flooding and, and flooding from the sky. Uh, but also, if you go to Iran, you get the other side of the, uh, the, other side of the story, uh, where you get the, the story of Ariana Vallejo, the, the paradise of ancient Iran, uh, where an advanced civilization existed and was destroyed not by a flood, but uh, by a sudden radical deep freeze. And the, the Iranian Noah is uh, Yima, and he's told, he's warned by the gods that the deep freeze is coming, and he's told to build underground structures to preserve against the, the freeze that's going to occur. Uh, both of these scenarios, the flood and the freeze, fit exactly with what we know about the Younger Dryas. And so what I'm saying is that this is the period from 11,600 years ago today, this is the period when the whole story of human civilization as it is taught to us supposedly unfolds. And we have this huge interruption before it called the Younger Dryas and these cataclysmic events at the end of the last ice age. And my suggestion is that the myths are true and that there was an earlier civilization and that we are a species with amnesia and that the destruction was so massive and, and, and so global in its extent and so cataclysmic in its form that we did have to begin again like children with no memory of what went before, or perhaps a little memory that was passed down by survivors who established locations all around the world, Giza, in Indonesia, in, in South America, in Turkey. That's what I think Gobekli Tepe is. I think it's a place that was established by the survivors of a lost civilization. That's why the agricultural revolution begins there suddenly overnight, just at the time that those Gobekli Tepe megaliths are being created just after the cataclysm that caused the Younger Dryas to set in. That's when we get the origins of agriculture. Sudden innovation in agriculture takes place. Um, it looks like it's an innovation that was done by people who already knew how to do agriculture, who were doing it somewhere else, not there in Turkey. So to close, this is our uh, beautiful planet. This is NASA satellite imagery. And this imagery is normally taken to, to remind us uh, of the effects of electricity and how, how it shows the, the developed areas of the world. See how bright Europe is compared with Africa. Uh, how, how bright North America is compared with South America. But what this image says to me, what it speaks to me about is the fragility of our civilization. That our, that our civilization, we take it all for granted. Uh, that it's here, that it's technological, that it's solved all these problems, that it's just always, always, always going to go on. But if we were to be confronted with a cataclysm on the scale of the cataclysm that caused the Younger Dryas, all those lights would go out, and they wouldn't come back on again. And you know the people who would survive? It's the people who are living in the dark areas who haven't had to live with technological specialization, who, who have learnt to fend for themselves and know how to do it. Our Western civilization is incredibly interconnected and integrated and based on specialisms. And none of us know how to do everything anymore. All of us know how to do our little bit. Um, food into the cities would run out in three or four days in the event of a cataclysm. 
Civilization is very fragile. The history of the remote past tells us that civilization is a fragile gift and that it can be taken away at the whim of the gods. And much worse, in our case, our own behavior, our own incredible arrogance and pride and stupidity as a species, not cherishing and nurturing the gift of thousands of years of accumulated civilization, but fighting one another and filled with hatred and envy and competition and greed, uh, the, the horrendous pr proliferation of, of, of nuclear weapons, the real danger of a, of, of a nuclear war b breaking out, much more likely, I believe, today than it ever was during the, the Cold War. Um, we could bring it all to an end ourselves. And somehow, for me, the message of the lost civilization is a message to cherish what we have and, uh, and, and to realize that it's a fragile gift and that it's, uh, that it's up to us if we move forward in, uh, in a positive direction or if we, if we let it all go. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think... <laughs> thank you. We, we're, we're running a little bit late, but I think we could take five minutes or so for, for questions if there's a, a, a mic uh, around. Five or ten minutes for questions. And then, and then I can take questions individually over there where I'll be sitting behind the table. So, anybody got any questions? <laughs> well, there's an aspect of this talk that I didn't go into tonight, which is that the figures in Tiwanaku... Who asked me that question, by the way? You're up there. <laughs> the figures in Tiwanaku, those have actually... This is very controversial, but what they're holding in their hands are actually snuff trays. And that form of snuff tray still exists in the Amazon. And it's DMT. <laughs> it's, a, it's a DMT snuff, so I think it was their stash. <laughs> the, sorry, the question again? Well, the pineal gland is this little gland in the center of the brain which actually produces DMT. The, the human... The, the life is a dream. I agree. <laughs> it is. But I hope it's a nice dream rather than a nightmare. Would I talk about my latest ayahuasca experience? Well, that's a whole... <laughs> That's a whole other talk. Um, actually, uh, the last time I drank ayahuasca was in January 2013. Um, I've had more recent experiences with smoked DMT in the form of changa. Um, look, I mean, these have been life-changing experiences for me. I've been working with ayahuasca for well, more than a decade now, since, since 2003. I, I suppose I've had in excess of 50 journeys with ayahuasca. Uh, ayahuasca has caused me to rethink just about everything in my life. My relationships with others, uh, how I function as a human being, my addictions, um, and the, the nature of reality. Because, because ayahuasca has, uh, has shown me at the level of experience uh, that this reality that we live in day to day is just one part of a much larger whole. Uh, and that we can't possibly get to grips with day to day life if we don't get to grips with the hidden reality behind it. Um, ayahuasca has brought that home to me in a very, in a very real and compelling way. It's uh, challenged me and uh, healed me on all sorts of, all sorts of levels. 
I do need to say the reason that I've taken a pause since January 2013, um, and it is a pause, I will be drinking ayahuasca again, um, is, uh, is some, some very challenging experiences that happened in January 2013. I believe that ayahuasca is totally a spirit of love and that, and that it is about bringing love and, and self-realization into the world and it is waking people up all around the world in, in an incredible and remarkable way. But there is a dark side to it. The dark side is not to ayahuasca itself. Uh, it's a dark side of humanity and perhaps a dark side in the spirit realm as well. When you open the veil, when you draw back the veil, which is what ayahuasca does, uh, it doesn't only draw back the veil to the forces of light, it also draws back the veil to the forces of darkness. And uh, we as human beings have to be very careful uh, how we function in those realms. And we have to be very clear about intent and about choice about what we do. Just as there is good and evil in this realm, there is also good and evil in, the, in the, what I would call the spirit world. And that's the role of the shaman. The shaman's role is really to keep those forces at bay. Uh, and it's why I don't urge people to experiment with ayahuasca in their kitchen. Um, I think that we, have a, we in the West need to sit at the feet of shamanic cultures and, and learn from them uh, ways to manage this powerful medicine. Uh, and, to, uh, and, and to benefit from it. And certainly, uh, no, nobody in their right mind would drink ayahuasca recreationally anyway. It's such an ordeal. Um, but, but I think it has to be approached with reverence, with respect, and in a spirit of love. Um, there, were some, there were some incidents that occurred, which I've described in an article in, in January 2013, which have caused me to take a, a pause. But uh, I will be back. I have more work to do with ayahuasca. Does that answer the question? Yeah, on my website. It's called Letters from the Far Side. It's on my website, grahamhancock.com. It's called Letters from the Far Side. And uh, it was written in about February or March of 2013. Yes. Yeah, I've been hearing about... I don't know. The, the internet is such, a, it's such a paradox, the internet, because it's, you know, there's so much truth and so much lies as well. Pe people just make stuff up. Sorry, I just asked, um, I read a, an, an article in the news feed on Graham's website about new megalithic structures that they have found in Siberia, in South Siberia, a place called Gordon Ashoria, but it's really yeah. hard to find more information about it and say if it's true. They're like 1,300 the Siberian, big. The Siberian information looks plausible to me. There, there are, ancient, not ancient, but it, explorers' illustrations from the mid-19th century which show those megaliths. Uh, I, think they're, I think they're real. On the other hand, the glass pyramids at the bottom of the Bermuda Triangle are total hoax. You know? yeah, this is the problem. Go and, go and check out Siberia and tell us what it's about. Yeah, I would say Siberia is the place to go. And, and the, the, the other thing that I found really annoying recently is lots of stuff on the internet about a pyramid dating back to the dinosaur age found in Crimea, which is supposed to be the cause of the tensions in, in Ukraine. I don't believe it. I don't believe it, not for a minute. I think it's all fantasy. Sorry, can I just ask about Bosnia as well? Have you been there and do you believe that? Going true? there in July. I, I know Sam Osmanagic quite well, but I reserve my judgment on the Bosnian pyramids until I see them myself, and we're going to make a field trip there in July. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, Hi. What, what are your thoughts on the uh, Egypt situation when the Germans scraped off the uh, thing on the pyramid? I would yeah. really like to know your thoughts about the whole situation. Mm. Um, my friend Robert Boval has been the person who's been most on, on top of what's happened with the, hier with the so-called scraping of the hieroglyph. First of all, those German guys didn't scrape the so-called Khufu hieroglyph at all. Uh, they did take some tiny fragments of paint from other hieroglyphs in the upper relieving chamber above the king's chamber. 
one of the, the there's actually very little evidence which ties the Great Pyramid to the period of 2500 BC, except for that one hieroglyph, that one uh, inscription in the relieving chambers. And that inscription purports to carry the name of Khufu, the pharaoh who supposedly built the Great Pyramid in 20 years of his reign. The possibility has been considered for a long time that that hieroglyph is a forgery. Uh, this uh, idea was explored extensively by, by Zachariah Sitchin in his, in his books. And Howard Weiss, the British explorer who discovered that inscription, had strong motivations to forge it. He needed a discovery. Uh, one of his uh, craftsmen was seen going in and out with paint. Um, and uh, there are there are orthographic problems in the inscription itself, which it seems to date, it seems to mix up two or three different periods of ancient Egyptian writing. It really does look like a forgery. And it's in plain view. It could have been forged in the 19th century. And I think that's what the Germans were, were interested in finding out, but they didn't actually sample the hieroglyph itself, which complicates the problem. What I found in the relieving chambers, which I did find convincing, was that if you go and shine a light, a bright light, into the gaps between the blocks, you can see that hieroglyphs do actually continue back into the gaps between the blocks. They're very simple, basic hieroglyphs. They look like um, very old kingdom hieroglyphs. And they, and they do go back into a place where no forger could reach. So I think in my own view is that the, the Great Pyramid, the completion of the Great Pyramid, the work on the King's Chamber, was done during the Pharaonic period, was done during the Old Kingdom. Uh, but I think it's possible that that hieroglyph, it doesn't have to have been done by Khufu. I think it's possible that the hieroglyph is a forgery, that one. But others could not have been, could not have been forged. Well, the Germans have been, there's a, whole, there's a whole series of issues and problems involving Zahi Hawass, uh, who was the once and future king of Giza, um, the, the director general of the Giza Plateau, minister of culture, this and that, got into trouble when Mubarak fell because his main sponsor was Susan Mubarak, the, the wife of President Mubarak. He's Teflon man, Zahi, nothing sticks to him, and he and he's, looks like he's getting back into, into power now. And he made a big fuss on the internet about this hieroglyph, about how the Germans had stolen the hieroglyph, and about how uh, Robert Boval had hired them to do that, which is all complete rubbish. Um, but it may cover up other damage that was done to the hieroglyph at a certain period, perhaps um, by the Egyptian authorities themselves. It's a very murky, messy, unpleasant story. Uh, but if those German guys go back to Egypt, they're going to go to jail. That's how it stands at the moment.